Good morning and welcome to a Monday morning Labor Day special edition of Coffee with Rich. I'm joined by Karen Whitlock. <clears throat> Good morning, Karen. Hello. I'm excited to do this. I'm excited to have you on the show. And while we're waiting for people to jump on on this beautiful Labor Day morning, let's talk about some of our amazing sponsors that we're blessed to have here at American Warrior Show that keeps the lights on and all the engines running. So we got amazing sponsors like Cool Fire Trainer. Cool Fire Trainer is an amazing training tool. I'm going to be talking to Karen this morning a lot about being a firearms instructor and an amazing tool that you can employ as a firearms instructor is the Cool Fire Trainer. It is your gun, your trigger, your sights. Now, there are some amazing tools like that out there, like the CERT, handgun shot, indicating resetting trigger by Next Level Training, an amazing tool. I would say, though, that Cool Fire takes it to the next level. It's your gun, your sights, your trigger. Your, all you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring and you have an amazing tool. Now, I will tell you, there's a backlog right now of about two months if you're trying to get a cool fire trainer because they're so much in demand with the ammunition prices being what they are. Let's also talk about Mountain Man Medical. Mountain Man Medical are doing some amazing things. Please check out Brian McLaughlin and everything that Brian and the folks at Mountain Man Medical are doing. Also, pick up one of the American Warrior Society co-branded trauma kits. Uh, they're amazing. You got... Uh, uh, I mean, just top-notch equipment in there. Brian McLaughlin, former Navy corpsman, uh, did a tour or so in Afghanistan with the Marines, as well as my dear friend Justin Carroll, who is now a paramedic and EMT. Uh, when he was a MARSOC Marine, we, we all collaborated on this. It's an amazing thing. Pick it up. Co-branded trauma kit over there at Mountain Man Medical. We also have precision holsters. I'm wearing my precision holsters tactical belt. They, they not only hold my pants up, but it is amazing. <laughs> It's an amazing way to secure your firearm to your body. And that um, holster that I use is the Ultra Appendix, also by Precision uh, Holsters. They also have a competition line, guys. So if you're in IDPA, USPSA, you want to pick up a new competition holster, I highly recommend everything that Precision Holster is doing over there. Appalachian Standard. My good friend Jesse Ross and his family are growing some amazing CBD products in the beautiful mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. Please check out APPHemp.com. And matter of fact, the easiest way to do all of our amazing sponsors, just go to AmericanWarriorShow.com. I've got a link in the show notes. And you can find all the discount codes for being a watcher of Coffee with Rich or the American Warrior Show. Last but not least, Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL, the striking opponent, body opponent bag. The Bob XL is an amazing striking tool. Why do cardio just run on a treadmill when you can strike it out with Bob and get your workout in? <laughs> and now, Karen, we've paid the bills. Good morning. Wow. Those sponsors. <laughs> I tell you, some amazing That's awesome. Folks. I need to strike it out with Bob. Oh, uh, yeah. He, I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah, I've seen you, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> have, have you ever shot Bob? No, I don't think I have. I've seen him um, like in a pepper spray class or something like that. Uh, so <clears> I've, sprayed, <throat> I've sprayed Bob. Oh, see, there you go. That's an, I've never mentioned that before. You can yes. use OC spray on Bob. You can shoot Bob with all the nine mil and five, five, six you want. He doesn't mind at all. Kick him, care. choke him. No, he doesn't care. He's real sturdy. Yeah. <laughs> He's a real sturdy fella. Uh, let me read Karen's amazing bio. I tell you what, before we do that, Karen, let's see who's on here so far. We've got John is on. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia. Steve is on from Ohio. Shelly is on. Says, good morning. Karen's the best. <laughs> Yeah, she's an amazing instructor and shooter as well. Jeff is on, says, good morning. Hope everyone is well. Bruce is on. Good morning. Coin number 481 from Michigan. If you want to find out what a coin number is, please check out the American Warrior Society and find out if our self-defense community is the right decision for you. Stephen Washington, our good friend. He's up there in Cedar Springs, coin number 2003. Nancy is on. Good morning, all. Shelly is on. Uh, Trisha Atkins says, hey, Karen. <laughs> hey. All right, let's read Karen's amazing bio. We'll get into this show. I've really been looking forward to it for a while. Karen, awesome. owns an, Karen owns an indoor gun range in Flowery Branch, Georgia with her husband, where she teaches basic pistol, concealed carry, red dot optics, and defensive shooting fundamentals classes, among other topics. She is also a chapter lead for the Well-Armed Woman and hosts a woman's group dedicated to continuing education at the range. In addition to teaching at her own range, she teaches basic handgun safety at a local university. 
Karen has earned the following instructor certifications. <laughs> NRA Basic Pistol, Chief Range Safety Officer, Personal Protection in the Home, Refused to be a Victim and CCW. U.S. CCA instructor in concealed carry, home defense, defensive shooting fundamentals, level one and two, as well as training counselor. Advanced range master instructor, defensive firearms coach through ICE. The well-armed woman certified instructor, deadly force instructor certification through Maasayud. Ma Ma I don't know why I can't say that. I can't ever say it either. <laughs> <laughs> Maas, we'll call him Maas. You know Act who he is. Yeah, you know who he is if you're watching the show this morning. <laughs> Active self-protection certified instructor, image-based decision, decisional drills instructor, modern samurai project, red dot instructor. Wow. Karen, welcome. That feels excessive, doesn't it? Thank mm -mm. you. <laughs> no, you're a very credentialed woman. Clearly. I had no idea until I started writing it out. And then I felt like, wow, maybe I've gone a little overboard. <laughs> well, there's an, another instructor certification that's not on there. That's I e know. Equally yeah. impressive. Uh, Karen attended, uh, that's where I met you out in Montana. Karen attended our uh, firearms instructor development courses this year. I did. And um, it's funny because when I was listing all that out or looking over it again this morning, I thought, oh, <laughs> I left off the most relevant one to you. I'm so sorry. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just happy to have you. Yes, I'm glad to be here. This is very exciting. I'm honored. What does that amazing bio overlook, Karen? What's missing? What does it overlook? I feel like, you know, I've taken a lot of classes, um, but I think it really just overlooks kind of just confidence. You know, you have to have a lot of confidence to do all these things. And I find in women in particular, we like to have someone go before us. And I think I've maybe mentioned that to you before. We like to have someone go before us. I'm one of those that I don't need that person to go before me. I like to just jump out there and do it. So I tend to sign up for things first and ask questions later, um, which is how I end up with in a lot of these classes. Fortunately, they've turned out for the best. Um, but I think it's just a confidence thing. And, and I think that's what I bring to the table for a lot of ladies without being too boasting of myself. I think they look at me and they say, oh, well, if she can do it, then I can do it. So it kind of these sorts of things, I feel like open the door for a lot of people just because it makes it seem more, more doable, more approachable, you know. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know that a lot of men are the same way. You know, one of the things when I was a recruiter for the Marine Corps is selling the Marine Corps in the sense that you're going to have to get on that bus and you're going to have to travel to Paris Island by yourself. And, you know, but, but you can understand that there's others that have been there before you and we can tell you what it's going to be like, you know, and I think that's something that you do incredibly well for your uh, group of ladies down there. Yeah. Otherwise it's just, it can, can be very intimidating, especially in the firearms industry where it is very male dominated. You know, I'm not really gung ho, let's go ladies kind of person, but it is very male dominated and that can be very intimidating. So I think it's important to, to bring those women in because they need to defend themselves as much, if not more than a guy would, Yeah, you know? And how did you get into firearms? <laughs> I had a very unconventional route into it. We actually bought the gun range and I had not really fired a gun ever. So <laughs> I quit my job as an, a banking officer. I, I researched credit card fraud for a living for like 20 years. And we got an opportunity to buy this range and I kind of cashed out and thought I would just sit in the back and pay the bills and do all that paperwork that is associated with owning a range and selling firearms. And people just kept asking me questions and I did not know the answer. So I felt like I need to figure this out because I'm a total fraud in this situation. People would ask me, you know, what kind of gun do you shoot or what should my wife get or what kind of holster or this or that? And they were asking me for advice to which I had no answer whatsoever. So after a few months, I decided I'm going to have to figure this out, not only for myself, but to be a value to this company. And I actually went to Glock 
they're in Smyrna, Georgia. So they're across the way from me. I went to Glock and took a class. I did not take a class from my husband, which is common advice that I offer to anyone. <laughs> we yeah. listen differently to, to other people than we do to our, our favorite people. Um, but I went across to Glock and took a class. And from there, I just decided I wanted to have a ladies group at our range. And part of that process to have this ladies group was I had to be an instructor. And having only taken the Glock class, I thought, well, this is a little bit of a stretch. So I met with a woman who I thought was going to sort of run the group for me. And I just needed to get the instructor cert as a check the box. And, you know, I wasn't really going to be responsible for anybody. And once I did all that, she sort of backed out of hosting the group and I was left to, to deal with these ladies on my own, which turned out fine because, you know, once I started teaching people, I realized that I really loved it. And I, I love teaching not only the ladies, I teach men now too, but, you know, back then it was mostly ladies and just seeing them go from this position of being maybe completely terrified of the gun or having no confidence in it to, you know, leaving after three or four hours, looking forward to coming back to, to shooting again and, and doing more practice. It's just really, it's really satisfying. It really makes you feel good. makes you feel like you've helped somebody because we have, you know, sometimes people will come in these beginner classes and we go around the room and, you know, I ask them, it's a small class, so it doesn't take forever, but we go around the room and I ask them, you know, what do you want to get out of the class? Let me make sure that, that we're on the right the right path here for you. And, you know, every once in a while you'll have somebody who, you know, they have a restraining order against mm. somebody. So they have like this real immediate need. And then, you know, sometimes you'll just have people who are fearful of the gun and they will literally start crying in class there with you. And it's, it's really amazing to see those people go from that state of fear and uncertainty to just, you know, yeah, I can do this and I'm going to come back next week and we're going to do it some more and I can defend myself. And it's, it's not, it's not as scary as I thought it was. Yeah. I love that. And I, <clears throat> I had a, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a similar experience, Karen, when I was, uh, when I was a police officer, they sent me and two female officers to the rad instructor course rape aggression mm -hmm. defense systems and uh and you know the main thing that we're supposed to that we're trying to accomplish is the empowerment of women let them know it's okay to yell it's okay to fight uh and uh, to see some of the women you know during the scenarios where i'd put on the fist suit and let them beat the crap out of me you know to break down in tears afterward because they they were a survivor of sexual violence or what have you and it was just it was emotionally uh uh empowering and at the same time you know, really powerful. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And I think it just drives home the importance of what instructors do, yeah. because a lot of times it's easy to forget that, you know, what the end goal is. And the end goal is you're helping these people defend themselves in some way. And, you know, it's easy to kind of take that from this theoretical thing and you forget, you know, this is life and death. I'm teaching someone a skill that, they may actually use someday to defend themselves. And um, it's just really a, a huge dose of reality when you have, you know, someone come in your class that's got that immediate, that immediate need, you know? Yeah. And I like something that um, you said, you know, you, you go around the, the class and ask everyone, what are you hoping to get out of it? Because, or why are you here kind of thing? I, I'm paraphrasing or can't really remember what you said, but that's pretty close. <laughs> but yeah, it's understanding the context in which they want to apply the information you're about to give them. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jay is on. Good morning, Jay out there in Hawaii. Coin number one hundred. Hawaii. Yeah. Wow. Jamie is on. Says good morning. Absolutely love Karen. Jen is on. Says hi, Karen. James is on in Ma Massachusetts. Coin number 1702. Thank you to the 20 folks that are joining us live. Please hit that share button. We are just getting started with, with Karen Whitlock. I understand that you have also ran several Ironman triathlons. <laughs> how did you get into that, Karen? Woo. Um, how did I do that? Sort of the same way I got into the firearms. I signed up and then asked questions later. <laughs> but the reality is I, um, once I got out of college, I decided that I wanted to swim for exercise. 
So I joined a master's group and just did a lot of swimming, an excessive amount of swimming. And they were all triathletes. And, you know, at some point, the, here's a funny story, actually. The first um, marathon that I did, I signed up for it because there was these ladies at, at the gym I was going to that had come back from Disney World. And they were bragging about this marathon they had just done. And um, I kind of like I tell people about me, I looked at them and said, well, gosh, you know, they can do it. Here we go. And I signed up for it only to find out a month or so after I had signed up for it that they didn't do the full marathon, which is the 26 miles. They did the half. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> well, we're committed. So here we go. But that's how I signed up for the, the marathons. And so I did my first marathon on my 40th birthday back in almost 15 years ago now. <laughs> but um, anyhow, so I had the swimming and the running. And one of my friends convinced me to do a little triathlon. It was a, a little sprint triathlon and I didn't have a bike. I hadn't ridden a bike since, you know, I had one with streamers and a basket years and years <laughs> yeah. and years ago, <laughs> more than 15 years ago. Huh. And um, so I got a bike and figured out how to, how to work it very basically, not, not great. And I muddled through that first triathlon and, you know, it just kind of progressed from there. But the funny thing is, um, one of my friends, she had convinced me to sign up for a half Ironman, which is basically a one mile swim, 13 mile run and a 56 mile bike. Not in that order, but she had signed up for it and wanted me to do it with her because that's what we do. We do things in groups. And at some point during that training, I remember very clearly I came up to a stoplight in my town and I just got to thinking, I'm like, you know, I know I can swim two and a half miles. I know I can run a marathon. What's 112 miles on a bike? That can't be that hard. <laughs> and that's how I signed up for my first Ironman. So it's a lot of just believing in yourself and doing some dumb stuff. <laughs> but that's how it came about. But, you know, I wouldn't change it for the world. It was the most amazing experience I've done. Um, five at this point and the confidence that it gives you and the belief in yourself that you know I can do anything like that that very first one I remember standing there I can still like visualize the whole thing the one the one that I started with they um it starts on the the beach in North Carolina and they play Eminem <laughs> and they start every triathlon with that Eminem song, right? And every time I hear that song now, it's just, I'm back with that beach. My toes are in the sand. I actually started, I don't know if it's the first triathlon, but maybe the second, next to a guy. He had no arms, and wow. he's doing the Iron Man, right? No arm. Mm -hmm. If he can do it, you know, what excuse do I have? But um, it's just one of those things that just it'll stay with you forever. And I know it sounds crazy. It's like, you know, people talk about CrossFit, you know, somebody's in CrossFit because they tell you. Yeah. Iron Man's kind of the same way, but it just really is life changing in the, the best way, the best way. Yeah. Tell us about, <clears throat> tell us about that first marathon, Karen, did you learn anything <laughs> in the preparation for it or in the execution of it or anything that kind of stands out as a life lesson? You know, the first marathon actually did not go according to plan or according to how I wanted it to go. You know, I did the training, you know, the first, the first events you do like that, you're scared not to do the training. So you stick to the plan and you do it because if you don't, there's, there's a horror story, a horror story awaiting you at the finish line or prior to, um, but it really didn't go according to the plan. You know, I was, my husband, Rick, was there at the finish line. And, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be done in about four hours. It's going to be fine. You just hang out. And it got to be like five hours. And he's like, what, where is <laughs> what is happening? And it just significantly, it was significantly slower. It was hot that day. I wasn't expecting temperatures in the neighborhood of the 80s or, you know, whatever it was in Florida. And, you know, things just did not go according to plan, but I signed up for that next one and I knew I could do better and I knew I could 
achieve. And I knew I could meet my goal. And I did. I went up to Ohio and did it. But what I learned from that first one and, and any of them really that don't go according to plan is have a plan B, you know, try something different. Just because something doesn't go according to plan doesn't mean we have to scrap the whole thing. You know, it would have been real easy for me to put my hand up and go over to the side and get on one of those buses that picks everybody up that can't make it and take them to the finish line. But, you know, persevere. There's another way through it, mostly. I mean, there, there will be situations where you just can't. But persevere, you know, see, see it to the end. You know, don't, don't quit. That sounds so <laughs> cliche, but that's the truth. You know, if you can make it to the end, do it. No, it is. <clears throat> it is. I agree with you. And I think that I learned a lot. It was too, you know, obviously a Marine and doing all the other stuff I've done in my life, but there's really two things that stand out that taught me. I don't say early on. One of them was I started flying planes when I was 16 years old. So, and, and soloed, I think before I even had a driver's license. So, and that showed me that, man, I, I can really do adult stuff. I can do whatever, you know what I'm saying? If I, yeah, pay the money. I, I worked at McDonald's making three thirty-five an hour <laughs> and saved my money, Karen, and, and, and paid for my flight lessons out of my own pocket. And I'm like, okay, it taught me a lot about myself. I would say the same thing for the first marathon I ran. Like you said, you have this plan and you got to stick to the plan. I think you and I were talking about it out there in Montana. And that is, I would wake up in the morning sometimes and I would be on the road and I would be in some weird hotel and some weird part of town I've never been in. And I've got to put in six, 10, 16, whatever miles that morning. And it means getting up early, running in the rain. It means a lot of things that taught me about mindset. And I wanted to ask you, Karen, like, did you learn about mindset in the preparation or execution for any of those triathlons or any of the hard physical things you've done? Oh, yeah, 100 percent. Because if you don't stick to the plan, it's not going to be a good outcome. Right. Just like I, you know, I stuck to the plan. It still wasn't a great one for the first, but it teaches you to really see something through to the end. And, you know, even if you're not feeling like it, do it anyways. I found a lot of times I would wake up back then when I, when I started, I had an eight to five job. So I would get up at 444. I don't know. I just mm -hmm. like the fours, but I would get up at 444 every morning mm -hmm. and go and do, you know, I'd either swim or run or bike or whatever it was. And there were plenty of mornings I did not want to get up and go and do, but I did it anyways. And I told my, I had a lot of talks with myself. I still do. But, you know, I told myself, like, if I was going swimming, you know, just go, you know, swim, swim like 500 meters. And if you're still not feeling it, get out of the pool. You know what? I never got out of the pool. Once I got through that, those first 500 meters or that first mile or, you know, whatever the deal was that I made with myself, it was fine. But it's just, sometimes it's just getting up and doing it, you know, get over that hump. And that, that's that mindset. Yeah. I've never heard anybody say that, Karen, because <clears throat> that's exactly what I would do. I'm like, you're going to lace your shoes up. You're going to go out there, run a hundred yards, whatever, you know, just get your butt in the pool, get under the weight one time. And then if, if you still want to quit, I'll let you quit. And, uh, right. and of course I would never, I never, you know, like I'm here now, I might as well put the miles in whatever, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that people that try to develop mindset by reading a book or listen to a podcast or doing it, you just can't. You got to get wet, get dirty, get sandy. Because one of the things I learned, I, I never ran anything more than a sprint distance triathlon. I've ran several of them. Yeah. And one of the things that shocked me about it, and you know, it's no stranger to you, Karen, is you're going to get your butt kicked in that water, man. I tell you. People just will beat the crap out of you and try to drown you in there. Yeah, they will. They will. Because for those of you who haven't seen it, there's you look a video, look up a video of a triathlon start. Any of them. Yeah. It's just and things might be different in the time of COVID. I don't know, but they just basically it's a mass of people. They hit the buzzer, and everybody starts running for the water, and it's fists and people pushing you under. 
people literally swimming over the top of you. It's crazy. It's crazy. And again, I go back to what a great way to develop mindset. <laughs> yes, right. I'm not going to die here in the swimming pool. <laughs> that's right. So uh, what advice would you give someone that's new to triathlons or that wants to run a marathon that wants to do their first one, or maybe it's just a 5k care, or maybe that's a big deal for somebody that's never been active. What advice would you give that person? Oh my gosh, just do it. Commit to it. Do it. Um, a lot of people do ask me about running uh, all the time because that that's the easiest thing to do. Swimming, you got to find a pool, you got to have goggles, you got to have all the gear. Um, not that much gear, but you do. Running, even if you don't have great shoes, you've got some shoes you can run in. Very few people don't. And you know what? A lot of people run barefoot these days. So there's that. But the main thing I would tell somebody, if you have not run before, get out there and do it. But when you get out there, don't think I'm going to run a mile nonstop day one at full out speed because that's that's a good way to discourage yourself. <laughs> you need to, you know, maybe run to that first telephone pole. If I can run to that first telephone pole, maybe walk to the next one and then run again. You don't have to get out there and run a 5K the first day because that's that's not going to encourage you in any way. I can promise you. <laughs> Take it little steps at a time. If you have to take walking breaks, so what? Take a walking break. Nobody care. Nobody cares mm -hmm. what you're doing. I know we like to think that people are obsessing over mm -hmm. us and what we're doing and, you know, oh, look at her. She's this or she's that or he's this or he's that. People do not care. They're so obsessed with themselves. They don't care. Just do what you can do and you know, if you just add a little bit every single day, you'll have that 5K before you know it. So get off the couch and try it. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Take Karen's advice. <laughs> let's see. Let's welcome some folks onto the show. Thank you for the 23 folks joining us live. And thank you to everyone that's going to watch on the Coffee with Rich YouTube channel or listen to this on a podcast in the days and weeks to come. Alan is on. Says, finally got a break. Got to listen to a live Coffee with Rich. Good morning from Occupied Virginia, coin number 1571. Key is on, says hi from Virginia. Marty is on, says good morning, Karen Whitlock. Uh, William uh, Rhodes is on, says good morning from Missouri. Skip is on, says good morning from beautiful Arab, Alabama. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I think take Karen's advice, get started. And maybe that's, Karen, a good segue for us to talk about someone that's new to firearms. What advice would you give those folks? Probably very similar. Just yeah. Get out there and take a class. Um, I touched on it earlier, but I think a lot of people are not, a, I won't generalize, but there are people who are, they're scared or they're intimidated, or maybe they just don't even see the value in it quite yet. Um, but maybe just take a class, see what it's about. I have plenty of people who will tell me they're, they're completely terrified when they walk into the class. Give it a chance, you know, have sort of an open mind about it. Um, you know, if you've maybe taken a class before and it was an instructor that didn't connect with you, try, try a different class. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's instructors out there that are great and there's instructors out there that, that maybe just don't, don't speak your language. Right. So, you know, don't give up just because you didn't have a good outcome that first time find another class, find a friend, you know, even if you don't want to try another class, get a, find a friend that'll take you to the range, but just give it a chance and, and stick with it. Because a lot of times too, I think people take that one class and they have that mindset of that. Um, they have that mindset that they've got this, you know, I don't need it. I've, I've learned how to load my gun. I'm going to stick it over here in this nightstand. And if anything happens, I'm good, you know, but there's so much more that goes into it. You know, you're, you, there's no way you're competent in one class. There's no way you're competent in two classes. You really have to continue on and on. And um, so continue practicing because it's just like driving that car. When I was 15 years old, driving a car and coming to a four-way stop was terrifying. Yeah. You know, I, I still am not sure who goes first, but, <laughs> <laughs> and now they put these roundabout things in, forget it. But um, it was terrifying. And now 
you know, so many years later, I don't even think about driving. I just back the car up. It's all good. You know, I can't parallel park. That's a different issue. But driving in general, I don't think about it. And I feel like the gun is the same way. You know, we think about all the little steps in the beginning. But once you do it enough times, you don't think about it anymore. And you have that confidence. So that was a very no. long answer. That's it. No, no that's great. <laughs> that's great. And I think, you know, uh, if you have something that's compelling you to want to learn firearms, especially in the day that we live in, uh, there's no better time than now. There are plenty of phenomenal instructors out there. You know, you can pick your poison, uh, so to speak. But one of the things you said is I was kind of chuckling, uh, Karen, and that is these roundabouts that we're starting to get here in, in the South. And <clears throat> I tell you, there's nothing more terrifying that we, we like to go to Scotland. My family and I do We try to make it up there about every year or so. And uh, when you're driving on the wrong side of the road and you're sitting in the wrong side of the car and you're coming to a roundabout at 50 miles an hour, you're talking about terrifying. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It is scary stuff. It was funny. They put, um, they just put a roundabout in up the street from us a few years ago. And it was very amusing to watch people try to navigate that. They initially treated it like a four way stop and then sort of people started kind of figure it out and, it's very humorous. I felt like we needed some instruction. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have a great deal of instructor time. Some might say you're a training junkie there, Karen. What makes a great instructor? Ooh, you know, I think that really depends on the person. You know, what I think is a great instructor may be different than what you would see as a great instructor. But for me, it's, I like an instructor who's engaging on some level. They don't have to be, you know, warm and fuzzy and jokesters, but I, I like to have someone who recognizes the fact that I'm here as a student. You know, I'm not just one in a crowd. Somebody that um, recognizes whether or not I'm actually learning, you know, is this person getting what I'm trying to say? And if she's not, is there some way that we can reconnect or rephrase or Maybe instead of speaking the language, maybe I can show her this thing, whatever it is that we're trying to teach. Um, but somebody that recognizes whether or not their students are getting it. And if they aren't getting it, they have that ability to regroup and figure out a different way. Or, or somebody that's willing to let go of the curriculum for a second and make sure that their students are actually getting what, what you're trying to teach them. Um, so those are kind of the top, the top ones, I would say. That's an interesting idea. I'll let go of the curriculum. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So a lot of times we, you know, we want to get our students from A to Z in this class, but maybe I have a class of six people and in this class of six people, for whatever reason, they're just not getting one part of that. Like we've gotten from A to B. But for some reason, C is tripping them up. So instead of just continuing on with my curriculum on my path to Z, I spend a little bit of extra time at C, whatever that is, um, you know, making sure that they actually get it. Or, you know, maybe I take a different path, uh, like a, di a diversion off the path to help them accomplish this thing. Because if I just keep trucking on through my curriculum without everybody following along with me, then I've lost them, you know, 10 steps back. I need to make sure that everybody's with me throughout the whole, throughout the whole class or have some way, like if I have an assistant instructor, have some way, if there's just one person to sort of help that, that one person get back up to speed or continue on at a level that's appropriate for them. Yeah. My brother, Jeff is on this one, Karen, and he's a retired, Mar yeah, he's a retired maritime law enforcement officer and federal firearms instructor. And Jeff says from her point of view, what do you think is the number one obstacle to train females new to firearms? If any, mm. I don't think there really is a differentiation, honestly, between men and women. We'd like to group people separately. And sometimes women like to take that, ladies only class because they like being in that group but as far as the instruction goes i really don't think i don't think there's that much of a difference now i do think they tend to gravitate towards maybe a female instructor so if you are 
instructing a class as a male, maybe look into having an assistant at least that's a female because that may help with that, that type of situation. But in terms of just ability and, and, you know, able to rack the slide and do those things, I feel like it's pretty similar. You know, it should be similar. There's really not that big of a difference that that's made out to be. It's more of just who they're attracted to as an instructor sometimes. Yeah. And in your class in Montana, it was interesting because I think you guys might have been our second open enrollment class. Normally it's a, like the, the two additional classes we have this year. One is for federal agents and the other one's for law enforcement. And in your, your class this year out in Montana, there was everything from, <laughs> I mean, we had knuckle dragon seals to, to, you know, I don't remember if there was a grandma in there or grandpa, there was a grandpa. So look and go with that. But <clears throat> it was a very diverse group and, you know, trying to teach to everyone to make sure that, Sometimes you do have to kind of throw out the curriculum and let's, let's talk about this. You know, we got some people that are not really getting it. Let's throw that question out to the audience and, and see what they can come up with. Yeah. And that, that is a tough one. When you have a wide variety of skill sets there, it makes mm -hmm. it, makes it difficult because you don't want to, you don't want to, um, I guess, lose track of where you're headed for the, the people that are getting it. But by the same token, if you've got people on the other end that aren't getting it, you've got to figure out how to balance those two things. Yeah. And that can be difficult. Yeah. What is the best advice, Karen, that you've ever given or received regarding firearms or instructorship, whatever? I would say just be yourself, be yourself and teach teach the, not, not necessarily teach the curriculum, but teach in a way that, that enables students to learn. So, you know, a lot of times I do, I am a training counselor for USCCA. So I get instructor candidates in my class. And as an example, we do the, you know, the, the rules of safety. So USCCA has their four rules of safety. And I will tell my instructor candidates prior to class I need you to come into class being able to teach me the rules of safety. Mm -hmm. So by and large, almost every single time when I ask them to get up in front of the class and, you know, teach just one, one or two of the rules of safety, they'll literally read the rule. That's mm -hmm. all they do. Like, you know, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. So if I've never touched a gun before, I, maybe, you know, I don't even, this is the first time I'm seeing a gun. You know, what does that mean? Why? I'm really big on the why. Like, yes. okay, so why do I need to keep my finger off the trigger? Is this off the trigger or is this off the trigger? You know, really go into a little bit more. You know, I tend to explain too much, but explain enough to where it makes sense. Um, because when you get into the why, why I'm telling you to do this, that's the part that's memorable. You know, that's the part I'm going to take home. I took a shotgun class with um, Tom Givens weekend before last or maybe last weekend. And, um, you know, there were just a lot of little nuggets he gave away that I remembered because he bothered to explain it. Like he was talking about um, ammunition, having the nine pellets versus the eight pellets. And the eight pellets have a little better pattern than the nine because of the way that they're stacked in the, the tube. And, you know, I just thought that was so cool. I'm like, God, oh, that makes complete sense. And I came home telling my husband all this stuff I had learned and it was all the little whys, you know? So I think explaining it really helps connect, connect with the students so that they retain it. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I think that uh, the why is of critical importance. And one of the things that as an example, I think we talked about it in the class out there was, as a brand new police officer, my field training officer said, okay, court, court runs Tuesday, Thursday, you know, plan your court on Tuesday. And I'm like, why? I don't know. <laughs> everybody, do every, yeah, everybody goes to court on Tuesday. Well, I'm one of those guys, like, if you can't explain why I'm going to do it my own way. And my own way was Thursday. Well, what I found out over time was there was a better judge. If you wanted a conviction, you go on Tuesday. <laughs> If you wanted to lose your case, go on Thursday because uh, he was siding with a criminal anyway. But uh, yeah, it, it, you have to be able to explain the why. And maybe you don't know the why. 
Uh, there's several examples of, you know, the, the, the lady that, you know, she makes the meatloaf and then she, have you heard this Karen? And she mm -hmm. cuts off a slice of it. And then she puts it in the pan and cooks the pan. And finally the husband's like, why are you, why are you cutting that last end piece off? I don't know. It's, I'm, my mom taught me and that's what she does. Hmm. Well, let's, let's go ask your mom. Why do you cut that off? She goes, I don't know. That's what grandma always did. And that's what we did. So then they finally get grandma at the nursing home. Like, why you cut that off? Well, honey, my, my pan wasn't big enough for all of it. So I had to slice them <laughs> off. But again, we got to understand the why or else we're just going to repeat these same patterns that maybe don't make sense anymore. Right? Yeah, that's right. Let's see. Alan says, I had my first student in a long time this week that just couldn't get it. Even my assistant instructors couldn't get through. Sometimes you get one that shouldn't be around firearms. My name did not go on the dotted line. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. And, and I know he's being funny, but it, it's true. It you is will true. get people, um, for whatever reason, I, we have, um, sort of an older community, I guess that's in our area. So I do get older students all the time and, you know, some of them, they just can't, they don't have the physical strength to handle a firearm. You know, they just can't rack the slide. And if they can't rack the slide, they're not able to pull the trigger on or press the trigger on a, revolver so you know that's kind of out and um you know there's some that just no matter how many times you explain keeping things pointed in a safe direction and keeping your finger off the trigger you know there are some that you're just they're not safe enough to let go and you know in those cases they end up with a cert pistol for the whole class but you know in the end even at the end of class you know sometimes you just have to have that talk that you know, I'm not sure that this is for you, but, you know, let's talk about some other ways maybe that you can defend yourself because, you know, you still need some way to defend yourself. But I just, you know, firearms aren't for everybody. They just yeah. aren't. They aren't. That's exactly right. And then OC spray is a is an absolutely amazing uh, force option. Mm -hmm. I'm a big, big fan. Uh, Jeff says, assuming she carries concealed nearly daily, what does she carry and how does she carry it? Holster, bag, et cetera. Oh, look at you. That is a great question. I carry right now, let's say, I carry the SIG P365 XL with a hollow sun. And I have the Eclipse holster, which is sort of that belted holster that allows you to wear pants that don't have a belt. Um, and I have a dark star holster attached to that inside the waistband appendix. I am getting ready to transition to the shield plus. I just, I have a Smith and Wesson hand. I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what a Smith and Wesson hand okay. looks like. Yeah. So I'm getting ready to transition to the shield plus Hollison also, but I'm getting it milled. Um, and I just found some 13 round magazines for it, which I'm pretty excited about. Cause prior mm -hmm. to that, I just had the one. And that was kind of holding me back too. But a, a carry appendix, um, I find that that's the most comfortable. And interestingly enough, that's the one that everybody freaks out about um, just because they don't understand. You know, they don't understand the safety of it. And I feel completely confident that if my firearm's in a Kydex holster or some sort of hard plastic holster, I have no issues carrying right there. It's completely safe. Yeah. Uh, are you, you said the Eclipse. Is that the Enigma? Did I say Eclipse? I meant yeah. Enigma. Sorry. Enigma. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I need Different to try e. one of those. Different E. I need to try one of those. Uh, but for right now, Precision Holsters, you have you have captured my heart. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's interesting because I think one of the things that I we get questioned from female shooters, like, uh, and, and I cannot answer them. You know, I'm like, I have no idea how to carry a firearm as a female because... You know, that would go with their, my, like my wife's outfits. You know, I have no idea other than some sort of purse holster. It's complicated. Uh, it I am, um, me and my uh, co-instructor with the Weller Woman and I, you know, every year we drag out our bucket of holsters and we do sort of a holster class in our, in our group showing, you know, the, the thigh holster and the inside the waistband, the outside the waistband. Um, we talk about purse carry. The end, the end of the story is that as a woman in particular, you're going to go through a lot of holsters before you find one that you like and that you think is reasonably comfortable. 
Um, I think sometimes we think that, or there's that misnomer that you're going to find a holster that doesn't feel like you're wearing a holster and that's just not reality. Yes. But um, you will go through a lot trying to find one that, that is correct for what you're wearing or feels comfortable enough that you would actually wear it every single day. Because if you're not going to wear it every single day, then it's not really doing any good as um, I think it's Tom Gibbons would like to say is, you know, you don't get to decide when you need your gun. Somebody else is deciding that for you. So if you're not carrying every single day, then your odds go down dramatically. Yeah, that's exactly right. And <clears throat> you know, the, with women, I see a lot of off body carry and um, I mean, that that's a solution, but it comes with a whole host of problems. Is that something you would ever recommend to your female students? I have a lot of people that, you know, that's the only way they, yeah. <clears throat> the only way they carry. And I'm sort of of the mindset is I'd rather you carry in a way that may not necessarily be the best way than not carry at all. Yeah. So with knowing that I would tell them, you know, you have to be extra secure with that purse. You have to have your firearm in a separate compartment within that purse. It has to be in the same place every single time. It has to be in a holster in your purse. You can't just toss that thing in a pocket and expect to, you know, be, be safe with it. So there are a lot of nuances to purse carrier off body carry. And, you know, while it wouldn't be, my first choice, I would rather they carry that way than not at all. And, yeah. you know, especially as a lady, sometimes, you know, you got a dress on or something like that, you know, there just may not be a holster that's going to work for that. And, you know, if you've got some way to take it with you, then do it. What about belly bands? Have you experimented with those at all? I have. Um, I They're fine. I don't mind them at all. My main issue with them, if, if you're going to wear them, a lot of times they're sort of a, a thicker cloth material and they don't mm -hmm. necessarily have great trigger protection built yeah. in. So I would say if you're going to get a belly band, look into some kind of Kydex inserts or, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of extra little holster that you can put in the belly band to give it that trigger protection, because it's just too easy with some of those thicker fabrics to accidentally press that trigger when you're sitting or, you know, if the, the fabric kind of loosens up over time. So, you know, I've seen people do a credit card or a driver's license as the trigger protection. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but you know, some sort of sturdy kydex that's not moving around inside your belly band, preferably one that you would just put on the gun like a regular holster and then put that in your belly band. Yeah. Sounds great advice. Thank you, Karen. Manhar is on from South Africa. He says, good to see a female online. It's difficult <laughs> for females to carry. How many times have you tried different carry positions before you found the right one? Mm, that is a great question. I, I don't think I've actually tried all that many different carry positions. Um, initially, you know, I went with outside the waistband because that's what you get taught in many classes is we're going outside the waistband. And then eventually I transitioned to the appendix just because I feel like that's the best for me in terms of being able to conceal. I'm one that prefers to have the gun concealed versus open carry. Um, in the state of Georgia, you can open carry with a license, but that's not not my preferred method. So I did. I feel like appendix is better concealment for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm big fan and Karen can, uh, I guess appendix carry since 95, I guess. Uh, since before it was cool, huh? Yeah. Well, back then we did, I, I'll <laughs> tell you, it was called felony carry back then or Mexican carry, which I don't know. If, now I don't it's know if that's more a, politically correct. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> there was no such thing as appendix. It's just uh, anatomy and, anatomically correct now <laughs> yeah matt is on he says good morning from alabama karen do you teach hey. a new student irons or red dots first Ooh, good question i irons or red dots i actually carry a red dot so that is an interesting question i actually teach them iron sights initially um I've heard it. I've heard the argument that red dot would be the way to teach a, a person in a, that they would get it a little bit more quickly. But I find that most people 
have the iron sights these days. So teaching them something that might be slightly more complicated is probably going to give them better education in the long run. Um, so that if they happen to have a gun that doesn't have a dot on it, they know how to line up those sights. Some conflicted, obviously, but um, I would teach iron sights first. Looks like I was muted there for there sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was going to take over the show, Rich. Uh, you can take it away anytime. <laughs> Marty says, thanks for the nod to purse carry. It's a viable option, but not for everybody. Jamie says, I absolutely love my Filster Enigma, but completely agree with Karen that everyone is different. We need to support women in whatever way works for them and provide them with the knowledge on safety and deployment techniques. Keep up the good work, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, Although I carry appendix, there's reason for that. It integrates well with everything else that I do. It may not integrate with what you do. It may not work for your body type. Everybody's different. Uh, it may not work with how you have to carry if you carry at work. Like we have a lot of physicians that are members of the American Warrior Society. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a good option for them. But, so, sure. you know, but again, I would rather them carry in an ankle holster than not carry at all. Right. I mean, similar to your point earlier. Yeah. And that's where the um, Enigma comes in. They can wear those scrubs mm -hmm. and the Enigma. Yeah. Yeah. I need, I, I, I do need to check one out. Although I don't like Mike Seeklander, he's always wearing athletic attire. Something like that would probably work with him since he's always in shorts or some sort of uh, athletic trousers. Yeah. Nah, not me. I don't. <laughs> I've hung like my cleats a, up. Like a good belt. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, Karen, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I've had you on here about 45 minutes or so. Thank you to the 30 folks that are watching. I want to ask, watching the events unfold in Afghanistan as a well-armed American, what are your what thoughts come to mind? God, there's so many things. I think it's heartbreaking to to watch it all unfold because you think, you know, you could you could go to that extreme and think, gosh, what if someday that was my government? That was my country. You know, how would I defend myself? And then you, your heart goes out to those people in Afghanistan that seemingly would not have any way to defend themselves, you know, and that really drives home the point of, I guess, the luxury of, of freedom that we have here to be able to make those choices for ourselves and the importance of continuing to support those choices or those freedoms, you know, and that, that drives home when different votes and things come up in Congress, you know, contact your congressman. I know it sounds like it feels sometimes like you're not really making a difference by giving them a call, but you've got to do something. And if that's your way to, to connect with Congress and, and the Senate and those sorts of things and have your voice be heard, then do it. You know, even at the state level, like if you can connect and um, reach out to your your congressman at the state level or become become active in, you know, carry organizations within your state. I think it's important to really safeguard those freedoms because we, a lot of times I think we take it for granted and it could change, you know, on a dime. You know, everything could turn. We've seen in the past couple of years, everything's kind of turned in a different direction and. Um, I think it's important to safeguard those freedoms, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, you know, starting with COVID and, and you know, everything that went on in the, the last couple of years. I've had so many people come in my class that would have said, you know, prior to 2020, there's no way I would have had a gun in my house. But now they're realizing that, you know, police response time in good times is about 11 minutes, you know, in the 12 yeah. major cities. And if it takes them 11 minutes to get to me, whatever threat has happened has come and gone. It has sure. already occurred. And there's just, you've got to take some responsibility for defending yourself. And I think that was uh, a harsh reality for some people in the past couple of years with everything that's gone on. And um, like I said, I kind of transitioned from Afghanistan, but it's easy to see like how things turn and change and, you know, how it, how it is important to, to maintain those freedoms and do what you can to, to be active in your community and, and safeguard that stuff. 
Oh, spot on, spot on, Karen. And, you know, to your point about how quickly things can turn, I mean, uh, Alan Kelly, who's a retired uh, Virginia State uh, trooper, says, yeah, look at Virginia. In one election cycle, they lost it all um, and are faced with really some of the most left-leaning Democratic, uh, I, I don't want to say Democratic, but some left-leaning policies that are trying to strip away the Second Amendment. And we are really only one election cycle away from some sort of policies that we may not want to conform to. And I, I watched yesterday, I don't know if you saw this because you mentioned COVID, so it does bring it up. There was a woman being a, viciously beaten on the streets of Paris by uh, police officers for not wearing a mask. I don't know if you saw that. No. I oh my God. It was hor <laughs> horrific to watch. I mean, there's like 10 or 12 officers around her and there's another woman with her who is wearing a mask and they're trying to help her up and push, push the officers back and they're just beating her to death it looked like with a ass baton because she's not wearing a mask and it's just like man are we really is this the world we live in now yeah it's um you know even things like that like it, you got to ask yourself like at what point am i gonna i guess take a stand for for what i believe in you know even if it may not be 2a it may be yeah. health or, or you know something else but you know at what point am i gonna have to just stand up and say you know what this is where my line is and I just cannot, I can't go along with this anymore. And that is kind of scary. I've, sometimes it feels extreme, but you know, some scarily enough, those extremities sometimes come into play and, and you have to be ready for that. So I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. You have to be ready. You have to be prepared, but you also have to be involved. And I think your point about writing your elected officials, you know, um, when I do it, I'll create like one email, I'll write it in Word, and then I'll I'll post it to all my elected officials. Yes. And so, again, guys, we have to do that. If they get 25 emails on one topic, that's a lot, you know. So yeah. flood these folks and let them know. If, if what, <laughs> Regardless what you feel, I'm not telling you how to think or how to feel. You, you do that. But uh, some of the comments that are coming in says, yeah, uh, Jeff says, amen. Tony says it's happening right before our eyes. Denise says one election away from insurrection. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary time. And thank you again to the 30 folks that are on this morning. With regard to Afghanistan, COVID, all the other things we see in the world, what is the long-term implication of this, Kara? Uh, I think the long-term implication is just... Um more reliance on self-defense, more reliance on ourselves versus, you know, we, we, I don't know, we all as a group, but you know, there are still individuals out there that have that thought that the government will save me, the government, this, the government, that, and, you know, again, with Afghanistan, you know, maybe those people had, had a good feeling about their government and now things have completely changed. So it goes back to that idea of, you know, you really have to have some self-reliance. You can't depend on the government to save you. Um, you know, at a high level, obviously there's concerns about the people that are still over there and, you know, what's going to happen to them. And, you know, are we vetting them to come into our country and, you know, their relationship with China and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, just at that individual level, you know, it's so easy to look at that and say, gosh, you know, you've got to be prepared to, to take care of yourself, no matter what the circumstance is. Yeah, solid advice. Because if you look back, you can find the pictures. They're all over the place online. What Afghanistan looked like in the early 70s. You had, it looked like a, a place in Chicago. I mean, the, the women were wearing the latest fashions and now they're covered head to toe and and the, the sad thing about this is, uh, you know, I, I thought that the Biden administration, being as woke as they are, was going to be pro-women's rights. And yet they let uh, the Taliban plunge women's rights back into the 13th century. It's absolutely sad and unnerving that that's happening. And, and it's not just that. It's the 27 Sacramento school children that, as of yesterday, are still trapped in Afghanistan. And nobody in the mainstream media is talking about that. Yeah, um, it's, it's crazy. Just the, the, the people that are left behind and with no real way to get out. And, you know, you've got these private groups and citizens now trying to, you know, organize an effort to go get them. But, you know, that's got its its own risks. You know, I'm not a I don't have a military background. You know, you, you obviously can speak more to that than I can. 
but it's just, it's heart wrenching because you think about, you know, we've, we've got the Sacramento kids that are still there. You know, they've got to be terrified of what's going to happen or, you know, am I ever going to be able to get back home? Um, am I going to survive this? Then you've got the people in the day-to-day -day life, you know, for 20 years, you know, if, if it's a 20 or 21, 22 year old person over there now, you know, the life that they've known is completely different or will be completely different now. And, um, you know, they're used to, like you said, they're used to being able to wear whatever they want and do whatever they want. And now I, I don't, I feel like their future is going to be very different for them. And that's, that's sad that we've abandoned that process in the way that we did. Yeah. Cause we, you, you know, I, I was raised under the tenet of leave no man behind or leave no person behind no sure. woman, whatever, but, and it, it, it doesn't seem to be the policy of the new administration. And uh, I couldn't imagine being a, a, a father of one of the children that are trapped in, trapped in uh, Afghanistan and my government just walked away and left them like they were expendable. Yeah. That. Yeah, uh, let's let's take the last question here and I'll let you take it wherever you want to, Karen. You know, what is something that our viewers, I ask this of everybody that comes on the show, what is something that the, uh, the viewer or listener today's show can do to make themselves harder to kill? I think just get training. Focus on training. Um, <laughs> we joked about it. I have a ton of training, but I felt like I was having to catch up, you know, because I started in adult onset firearms. Um I started late. So, you know, I got a lot of training, but continue to train, you know, even if you can't go to the range, I know ammo is ridiculously expensive still. It's not as expensive as it was, but it's still expensive. Even if you can't get to the range, do some kind of training, right? Because you mentioned you've got the cool fire, the cert pistols, even if you don't have those, you know, I always suggest to people, you know, even watching videos like, you know, not everybody likes watching the news, but you see on the news all the time incidents where, you know, someone's been carjacked or you're talking about the, the woman in um, Paris that's being beaten. You know, put yourself in that situation and think, you know, what would I do? How would I get out of that? Or maybe you're just at home. You're laying in your bed. You know, if somebody comes in the door right now, where am I going? What am I doing? What do I need to grab? You know, visualize that situation. It's kind of interesting. And you, you may have heard of this. I feel like you have. But there was um, a study done with some basketball players at the University of Chicago. And they divided the basketball players up into three groups. One group practiced free throws every single day for, I think it was an hour. Another group visualized the free throws every single day for an hour. So they didn't even touch the basketball. The third group did nothing. They didn't visualize it. They didn't think about basketball. They did nothing. At the end of the 30 days, the group that performed the free throws physically improved by 24%. So their, their free throws got a lot better. The group that just visualized it and never even put a hand on a basketball, they improved by 23%, almost as much as the group that actually touched the basketball. So don't discount those little things that you do mentally because the mental process is huge in, in your training piece. Um, it's, it's something that really has, really can come into play and really can be very helpful despite you know, your thought of, well, I'm not really touching a gun. I'm not really, you know, doing things, but the mental process goes a long way in helping prepare you. Yeah. I love that. I agree with that. And, uh, you know, we started off the show talking about, you know, your time as an Ironman triathlete and how that would develop mindset and the ability to overcome any obstacle, create a, a good plan and then execute aggressively execute that plan and stay on track. And I think that that final piece the visualization piece is also equally important. Uh, so well said there. Uh, Manhar says, this is hilarious. My mom is watching. Hello, mom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> hey, mom. That's a shout out to everybody's mom out there. Yeah, the mental exercise piece is incredibly important. There's a story, and um, I can't think of the name of the book, where a uh, an American uh, pilot is shot down over North Vietnam. He spends the next five, six years in a prison cell in Hanoi. 
And every day he uh, mentally plays golf. And because he had played a lot of golf before he joined the Navy and became a pilot, he knew what Augusta was like. He knew how, you know, the eighth hole ran and stuff like that. So he was able to every day. And even if he wanted to play Augusta two or three days in a row, he would change the weather in his mind. He would change the greens in his mind mm -hmm. so that when he got out, uh, as the story goes, he was in San Diego recuperating and they took him by, they were taking him up to Balboa hospital. And on the way there, he said, there's a golf course. And he's like, please stop the, can we just go over here? I just want to meet the golf pro. And so that he goes in and tells the golf pro, I just got released from Hanoi Hilton. And it was like, Oh my God. Hey, if you want to shoot around, I'll give you some golf clubs and we'll go out there together. The guy had the best golf game of his life and he hadn't touched clubs in six years because he's like, how are you doing this? He's like, I play golf every single day. I play golf every single day for the last six years. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I think, um, you know, in the last year, if you weren't doing dry fire, you probably are now because of the ammo thing. And, you know, just, just like that, just like the basketball, just like the golf, you know, it really does sort of, you know, the myelination in your brain, it sort of cements that stuff so that it becomes natural to you. And it's, it's not such a foreign idea that I'm going to actually have to pick this gun up and defend myself. Yeah. And Matt Sims is on here. Of course, Matt's been a guest on the show. He's a law enforcement officer as well as a professional shooter. And he says, William April training. And yeah, I believe it was William April that said, you know, take the newspaper. And when you see that horrific incident that someone found themselves in and survived a, an incident, or maybe they didn't survive, think about how you would have handled it. See yourself winning and succeeding. And I think that'll gain them confidence as well as preparedness. What do you think? I totally agree. I totally agree. Like all those little incidents, whether it's a newspaper or, you know, the, the video online. Um, there was a woman just the other day, I think it was Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, um, at a gas pump. She pulls up to the pump to get her gas. And there's a guy. Um, so there's people maybe on the right side of her that are getting gas in their car. And there's a guy on the left side of her just kind of hanging out by that little pylon that that they do to protect the pump. He's just standing there. You know, she didn't give that person a moment's thought. She gets out of her car and he sort of beelines towards her, you know, to try and at an angle and picks her up and, you know, shakes her down, tries to get her keys and whatnot. And, you know, that's a perfect one because that's something we do almost every single day or at least once a week. You're getting gas, you know, like pay attention to what's around you. But that's a perfect one to to put yourself in that situation. You know, if I see some random person standing at the gas pump, maybe I need to pay attention to that. You know, there's no law that says I can't leave quick trip and go over to racetrack. That's you right. know, if things look sketchy here, let's get in the car and go. You know, to me, the thing that I advise most people is, you know, even though you have a gun, we don't need to use the gun. Yeah. You know, if you can get out of that situation, I don't care if you would have been perfectly in the right to pull your gun. If you can get out of that situation, go, because that's going to save you all that mental anguish, all the, you know, attorney's bills, all that social drama, you know, you'd be all over the news and everything else. If you can avoid it, that's the way to go. But yeah, putting yourself in those situations and really think about, you know, what would I do? It just makes you more mentally aware of what's going on around you. Yeah. Awareness and avoidance is key, which is what Manhar yeah. says. <clears throat> of course, Manhar, uh, we did two, two shows with Manhar recently about the riots in South Africa and his yeah. involvement in there, which is really compelling stuff. But, you know, and, and a shout out to our good friend, John Correa over there at Active Self-Protection. If you're not watching his content, please Absolutely. subscribe to, uh, to John because uh, to Active Self-Protection and you can watch those videos and learn so that you don't have to be a victim. And your point about if it looks sketchy, drive on down the road where it's not right. sketchy. Because I think that woman, if I remember the video you're talking about, Karen, it was the middle of the day, was it? Not? It was. It was yeah. the middle of the day. And um, there was another car at the pump. And, you know, in my conversations about it, you know, people ask me, like, why didn't this other car do something? Well, they might not have known really what was going on. They may not have felt safe to get out of that situation. So they thought it was a boyfriend or something like that. Who knows? Yeah, You misread stuff all the time. There was a story the other day of a woman pulling a gun in a drive through because she got the wrong drink. You don't, you know, you misread situations all the time. And um, 
you know, as a, a, a bystander, you may not want to jump in. You may not feel safe. Your safest option may just to be to be a good witness. But it was the the middle of the day, broad daylight. Um, and, you know, those are the things that make people think it couldn't happen here. I don't need to carry my gun here. It's a safe neighborhood. I don't need to carry my gun now. It's the middle of the day. Look at all these people around me. Nothing's going to happen here. But, you know, there's there's a story of a woman getting um, carjacked and murdered on down the road at a Sonic years ago. And I think it was somewhere in Tennessee. Um, but broad daylight, 41 people at the Sonic. Nobody stopped to, to say anything or do anything or, you know, they didn't know what to do or maybe didn't even notice it was happening. But you can't be naive to think. It's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen here. Um, there's 2.5 million self-defense type incidents every single year. So your odds are probably one in four that something's going to happen to you. And you need to be ready for that. That's exactly right. And you can drill down into the statistics and look at where the where you're most likely to con confront these things. So uh, I, you know, the more that you can arm yourself mentally, the more you can avoid those fights, like you said, Karen, so that you're you know, the best fight to be the best. I had a martial arts teacher yes. tell me once, son, <laughs> he, he said, the, the best place to defend is someplace that ain't being attacked. And, yes. I, and I think that sounds so simple, but it's true. Ruben says, I love Karen. <laughs> I love Ruben. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I love you, Ruben. Uh, Tony says, stay out of the fight. Guile says, good point. Avoiding trouble is avoiding a bad day. Ruben says, my coffee is more impactful with a serving of rich brown in the morning. Hey. Yeah. Uh, Sheila says, I'm going to bring Karen with me everywhere I go. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be safer for it. I'll tell you that. Uh, Karen, I've kept you on here long enough. Uh, it's been an amazing show. Where can people find yeah. you? Um, so you can email me, Karen at TriggerTimeRange.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on all the things. Not TikTok. I don't do the dances. But <laughs> um, yeah, just Karen Whitlock. I'm at Trigger Time Range. So just Google me up. You'll find me. Thanks for having me. This was super fun. Yeah, super fun. We'll have to do it again sometime, Karen. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? Just keep training, keep practicing. Um, you know, nothing gives you confidence like practice. Being co being competent, competent gives you confidence. That's right. Yeah, well, it's been a great show, Karen. Uh, everybody watching out there, the thirty four folks that are still with us this morning. Hey, thanks for being on the show with Karen and I. And remember, folks, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>